to read something for you. It's called the dirty laundry. The dirty laundry. A young couple moved into a new neighborhood. The next morning while they were eating breakfast, the young woman saw her neighbor hanging washing outside. The laundry is not very clean. And she doesn't know how to wash correctly, she said. Perhaps she needs better laundry soap. Her husband looked on, remaining silent. Every time her neighbor hung her washing out to dry, the young woman made the same comments. Look, her laundry is dirty. She needs a different laundry soap. Yeah, she needs to be taught how to wash. She's not doing a good job. A month later, the woman was surprised to see such a nice, clean wash on the line and said to her husband, Look, <laughs> finally, she's learned how to wash correctly. I wonder who taught her this. And the husband looked at her with a smile and, and said, I got er up early this morning and cleaned our windows. I got up early this morning and I cleaned her window. This is why her wash looks so nice and clean. Isn't it so with life at times as well? What we see in others as we watch them, how we perceive ministry, how we perceive a lot of things, sometimes it's all dependent on which window or how clean the window is that you're looking through. The subject of this message this morning that I called the title, The Clear Vision, hopefully is to encourage us to never lose our focus on Christ. Christ is our very existence. Christ is the only way we have true life. And in the scripture, we are challenged in many passages to look at the glory of the Lord and keep our eyes steadfast on him. To make sure that the filter we are looking through is clean, that is our lives. That we walk accordingly, that our eyes might not be blemished, that lest we look at something and, and we're looking through a perversion, a perverted vision, if you will. Hebrews 12 and 1 reads as follows. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I realize I didn't give it to my PC guys, I believe this morning. Hebrews 12 and 1 and verse 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. It's stressing the importance of us keeping our focus on the Lord. The pioneer, he is the originator, the author, and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Clear vision. In the scriptures, passage upon passage, we are encouraged, we are admonished, sometimes we are rebuked, we are chastised sometimes. All in the encouragement of us learning how to pay attention to our walk in Christ. Never diminishing the importance in our hearts of how important it is for us to chase after and do everything we can to become as Christ or in his likeness. 
Romans 8 and 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined. Did you know that it's God's plan? It's God's predestined plan so that you would look like his son? That his desire is that every single one of us would look like his son <clears throat> and take after the character and the person of his son? He also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brothers. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18. And we who with unveil, uh, unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed. Everybody say loudly, transformed. Now put your hand on your heart. I must, I must be transformed. Now put your hand on your neighbor's shoulder, your husband, sister, friend, and say, you must, you must be transformed. Mm. Mm. That's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It's not something, some wishy well, good desire. It's a commandment of the Lord. Because this is God's will, and anything that is God's will is a commandment of God for us. If we aim to please him, if he says, I want you transformed, he's not suggesting it. He's not saying, well, I really would hope you would. No, no, no. He's saying, I need you transformed. Our being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Philippians 3 and 12 by the way, let me just say, I will not finish this sermon. I will finish it next week for the sake of time. I'm sure we'll run out of time. I have so much to say to you this morning. I hope that this will change and pray that this will change your life. Bless your life. Encourage your life. Raise your life to a higher level in Christ, I pray in Jesus' name. Not that I have already obtained, Paul writes in Philippians 3 and 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on. Key words. Let us learn to read God's word and let those key words jump out at us. We can read, uh, not that I've already obtained this. And sometimes we lean on that saying, you see, he wasn't perfect. You see, he had trouble too. We have this adage here, it's nothing but excuses. No one's perfect. All of us fail. We understand that. That's an unwritten rule. While we're in this flesh, we're always going to fail. But the fact remains that, that that does not alleviate us from the responsibility to press on. It does not re relieve us from the commandment of God, the admonishing encouragement of God to press on. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I loosen your word this morning. And I pray that that which comes from me would fall on dry ground. But that which your Holy Spirit would speak would find its place and nestle itself, weld itself, sear itself in the hearts of your children this morning, that we might all be changed, beginning with me. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son. We are being transformed into his likeness. We are called to press on and take hold of that for which Christ has taken a hold of us. Succeeding, ladies and gentlemen, in life has always been a great feeling. Reaching a mark, accomplishing something has always been a great feeling in the lives of anyone who experienced success. How many would agree with me this morning? You know, when you pass a test, young people in college, yeah, you feel great. When you get that promotion you've been working for so much at work, yes. When you're able to lose the pounds you want to weight in your diet. Yes. So you treat yourself to a cheesecake. Success feels great. Amen. 
because you arrived where you wanted to be. Whatever it might could be. Of course, my leaning this morning will be making Christ our goal. And raising the mark or the level of our desire to finish and receive the crown of success in the presence of the Lord. But overcoming and standing in the victory circle is always of great feeling. In the simplest things, as I mentioned before. In the simplest things. But in living in Christ all the more so. You know, this past, not this summer, but obviously last summer, you know, uh, uh, because of my transplant, um, I received a high dosage of steroids uh, for the swelling in my visceral organs, my liver and kidneys and stuff like that. I'm still continually going to the doctor to Houston, to Luke's uh, for my exams. And you, you know my story. And it was for a while, you may remember that some of my boys would walk up here and hold me from the hand, and I'd walk up to the pulpit. And I, once I was on flat ground, I was okay, and I'd be holding on to my pulpit, and i preached to you. Remember that? It was tough. It, it was a tough time. And, and I never really thought that I would never not need someone. I had been recommended by one of our beloved brothers to build a rail on, on the side of the, uh, the stairs, which might still be convenient for ladies and stuff like that. Certainly for me at that time, because I needed to hold on. Even when I get off now, I'll hold on to the wall and walk out. Well, that's one because I'm 63 years old already. But the other because I still have a very bad hip, and they had recommended a total hip for me. But I'm tired of knives. I don't know much about it. I'm tired of knives. And, and so I'm telling the Lord, Father, uh, heal me or shorten me my life here because I'm not going to go through another cut. So I never thought that I'd be any use anymore physically to be able to put my own shoes on anymore. I, when you can't bend over uh, to do things, you become very crafty. and You develop things that will pick up your pants and everything else and uh, how to put your shoes on with things that you, you extend your arms to put things on. And it's, it's incredible. That's how, where geniuses are born, through hardship. Well, many of you know also that I'm a, very much an outdoorsman. I enjoy hunting and I enjoy fishing and and I have a great time. Well, we had purchased a small place up in West Texas, as we always have for the past years, as you know us. But we sold everything because of my liver transplant. And I didn't think that, you know, unless the Lord did something, I was going to go home to be with him. So I didn't want to leave my wife all the responsibilities of the things that I, that I have. So we did it again because obviously I'm still here and I'm doing okay. And so my wife said, I think we should go get another place because we really enjoy being out there. We really do. Anytime we, we don't like people. <laughs> you know what I mean by that. I'm not the Galleria guy. Not even my wife is the Galleria. Oh, go to Houston, the Galleria. Yeah. Never. Never. We want to go out in the trees in the woods and shh, hear nothing but Jesus and the birds. And so we got this place. And I'm thinking, speaking to you about success, but because I have girls, if it was just boys, that I had boys, I, I'd pitch a tent and we'd, we'd go and we'd hunt and we'd do everything in a tent on the ground. I don't know about the boys now. I, they probably want a flush bed too. But. <laughs> but I decided to build a cabin, and I did. And because, again, my boys work and because I had no one to go help me do it, I said, you know, I'm a carpenter's son. And I know how to build a home. And so I was afraid at the beginning because I said, I, I can't pick up. I can't carry. I can't even climb a ladder to nail. I can't. But I said, if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. My wife will never be, enjoy, uh, will be able to enjoy it and we'll never go out there. So I said, yes. I bit my tongue. And for six months, you may have not known this, but I was spending three, four days up there by myself. And with some help that I got along the way, the major part of all that cabin, I did it myself. And I should show you pictures. You'll be impressed. Some of you have seen them. But I took my time. The point being, not that I'm a good carpenter. No. 
The point I'm trying to make is that it felt awesome when I was done. Wow. I, I came home. I couldn't wait to get my wife and my family to go out there and take a look. And when they walked in, they said, wow, Dad. I said, you see every stick you see every molding, you see the flooring, you see the cabinets, you see the sinks, you see the bathrooms, you see everything, the doors, yeah. That's right, you're looking at it. And I felt like a winner. Now I'm kind of sad because I finished, I have nothing else to do. But point being, success always feels good, ladies and gentlemen. When you got your degree at college, young people, those of you who graduated, how awesome, right? Fun, 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 fun. Wow, and, and that show is all about you. And all of us who are invited to go out and see you, we, we're cheering for you. And it's that way when you do things in life. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants us to experience that kind of euphoria. As we think about finishing our walk and our race in the Lord. Sad part about it, ladies and gentlemen, today is I said, I won't finish, so... Don't say he's not even starting yet. I, I mean, I'm not even going to start maybe this morning. The sad part about it is that even in the Christian realm, even in the church, the eyes of the people in the pew, on the pulpit, wherever, lose their focus on the initial purpose and predestination of their lives. And they said, I want to be a successful businessman. I want to be a successful carpenter. I want to be a successful biologist. I want to be an astronaut, whatever it is. And you set your goal to it. I want to be a successful musician. I want to be a successful this and the other. And you set your things on things other. Not that that all is bad. But anything that takes place of your focus on God becomes an idol to God. Every single one of us in this house has the potential of raising idols for ourselves. For me, it could have been finishing that cabin and starting another one and begin to unobligate or disobligate myself from the responsibilities of my purpose in life. And where's pastor? Well, he's out building cabins now because he could do it right. Anytime we lose sight of the primary focus for which we are made, we build an idol. If you lose your sight and your focus of Christ, you lose everything and you lose your way in life. You will end up in places. This is why families break up and fall apart. This is why young people destroy their lives. This is where brothers and sisters who were in the Lord at one time, once they lose sight of Christ, everything begins to fall apart. It may not fall apart tomorrow. But ladies and gentlemen, let me say this is absolute truth. It will fall apart. It will. Focusing on the Lord, keeping your walk with God is the primary, most important thing according to Scripture, according to me and to you as Christians that we should do in our life on a daily basis. We press on every day to become and embrace the likeness of Christ. And unless you keep your eyes clear from the fog of what this world offers you, I remember being a musician and I was a guitar player back then. I sang and all these things. When I became a Christian, I had the greatest opportunities to go play with people that you know and heard of. I had the opportunity to leave my family for a month or two, live out of a suitcase and make real good money to go and hit the stars and the stages and become a guitar player for a very popular individual. And not once, but two or three times in my life, I had an opportunity for, to receive and to achieve what many, maybe possibly you, would call success. The world for sure would call it success. Oh, man, Israel made it, man. He's playing guitar for this person, for this band, for this group. Oh, if I could do that. Oh. 
So I can say this at the same time. We have to acknowledge the difficulty to blur out that which shines and catches our eyes the most and keep our focus on Christ and say, I'm not going to ruin my life that way. But many people possibly who are not even in this pew today are out chasing a dream other than Christ. Those of us who have served the Lord over for a few years, we've known people who at the beginning were, oh, hey, praise God, man. I'm on fire for Jesus. And today you'll see them and they are away from God. I know people from the pulpit. I know musicians. I know pastors. I know people in the pew that at the beginning they were on fire for God. But I'll see them at H-E-B. I'll see him or over there and whatever. What are you doing? This is what the devil does. It makes you an atom. Hey, come out, man. No, it's cool, man. I'll see you later. Bye. The embarrassment, that's what Satan does. He'll pull you away and embarrass you. That's what he did to Adam. Adam. Yes. Where are you? <laughs> I've never heard your voice sound that way. Oh, I'm just going to cut a gizzard right now. I'll see you later. The Bible says he used to walk with him in the clear of the day. But now all of a sudden, because he lost his focus on God, his mouth muffled and his praises diminished. And his walk was loosened. All because he lost his focus. Because he lost his focus. We as Christians have one priority in life. And this is what Solomon said. The whole business and the whole matter of man is to love God and obey his word. That is the whole business. If someone was to ask you, so what's your purpose in life? My purpose is to love the Lord and obey his word. No, but really. No, no, really. But what do you do? Oh, my profession here? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm a businessman. This is what I do. I'm, I'm a teacher. I'm a professor. Uh, I, I do this or the other. Oh, okay. But you talk to me about my purpose. My primary purpose in life is to obey God and to love God. That individual will succeed because the Bible says he will. Ladies and gentlemen, we are called to be clear-eyed. When it comes to our walk with God. Again, it's not easy. A professor from a university writes concerning goal setting or purpose setting, if you will. He speaks of the truth and the struggle to achieve them. He said, from the moment people decide to concentrate all their energies on a specific objective or goal, they begin to surmount the most difficult odds. So this whole idea, Jesus has me spoiled, is a bunch of baloney. He may want to spoil you and bless on you and keep you, but I'll tell you what, the devil wants to kill you. That's where insurmountable difficulties come from. It's not that God's trying to push you back and say, come on, keep wrestling. Come on, no, no. The devil's in the way. There's someone who neither sleeps or slumber, and his name is Satan as well. He's out for your soul. But any time we set our objective to serve the Lord, that's when situations really begin. You may remember that the people of Israel never knew what a giant was until they started their journey towards Canaan. We've got to keep our focus. And unless we keep our focus... We will lose our way. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 9 and 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run? But only one gets the prize. 
And who might you think that would be? It's the most dedicated, the one who trained the most, and the one who keeps looking towards the finish line. Only one gets the prize. It's all about clarity of vision. I pray today the Lord would blow away the clouds of confusion and blurriness in the eyes of some possibly this morning. You must be focused. It's been years that I've given you an acrostic sermon. I've got a few minutes to begin and I will probably do half. But those of you who don't know what an acrostic sermon is, it's basically taking a word and for every letter giving you a principle that you might be able to refer to, that you might remember that principle and apply it to your life. I, it used to be years ago, I used to do that more, and the church would tell me, we really love when you give an acrostic sermon, Pastor, because we write the word down and we remember what principles you taught us there specifically. And so I'm going to do that for you this morning. Is that okay? I want you to write down in your Bible somewhere on your phone, somewhere it will, it will not be erased, the word focus. This is what I want to speak to you about. Young people, listen. Dad, mom, listen this morning. This will save your life. And this will keep you from making the biggest mistake that everyone who has blurred and double vision and loses her sight of the purpose that God has for you. As we mentioned this morning, it is the primary purpose of the Lord that we become in his son's likeness, in his nature, his attributes, and his character. Well, you never learn anything from anybody unless you keep your eyes on them. And by continuing to emulate those things that we learn as we watch them, in this case, Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, But women will be saved through childbearing and by continuing to live in faith. That means when you learn the trait, when you learn the characteristic, when you embrace that which Christ can teach you, you continue to live with that purpose at heart. So let's go to this acrostic this morning. Obviously, the first letter in focus is F. And the first thing you're going to write on your notes or try to remember, you must be clear to fix your eyes on your desired goal. Let's fix your Thoughts and actions on the desired accomplishment for your life. You can write it down any way you want. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. We read this passage. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Straining toward to what is ahead. You see that in that knowing what's ahead is where Paul found his encouragement. People get fearful and are afraid when they don't know what's coming. Anybody ever experienced that kind of fear? And what do you think they're going to say? Here comes a doctor. What do you think his news is going to be? You lose yourself in a road. I wonder what's up ahead. It's all dark. And so you almost let go of the accelerator pedal a little bit because you want to slow down because you're nervous about not knowing what is ahead. People today are afraid to die. They don't go to funerals for the sake of not facing the reality of death which is probably the most real thing in life. But they don't. Why? Because no one knows. At least they don't know what goes beyond the grave, that dark hole, that great expanse that no one knows. 
I wonder what's going to happen to us. Do we just float around? What is it? Fear. The lack of knowledge births fear. But listen to what Paul said. I'm straining toward to what's ahead. That means that he knows exactly where he was going. He knows exactly what he's going to run for or where he is directing his paths to. He finds his strength in knowing that if he doesn't have to slow down because his encouragement comes in knowing that up ahead is his desired goal. Do you see what's ahead of you? Can you see that far? What is ahead of you? What have you placed ahead of you that you're chasing after? What is it really that you're looking to arrive at? What are your eyes really focusing on in life as believers? Are you setting your eyes on Christ or are you setting your eyes on personal, horizontal goals in life? The first step to becoming like Christ as a goal is to make Christ your focused goal. The first thing that we need to do if we're going to become Christ-like is to keep your eyes on the Lord. To keep your eyes on Christ. If you are still even today at a yesterday and no tomorrow or I don't know really I was... I'm discouraged right now. Oh, uh, I, I may, uh, I, I feel like going to church. or yeah, I feel, Actually, I feel like doing this or the other. And you're double-minded. You, the Bible says that you can expect to receive nothing from the Lord. Don't kill the messenger. Look at James chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. Write it down. Read it for yourself. This is God's word. How many believe in God's word? Say, Pastor, this is not your word. Now you're believing it's my word, right? Pastor? We can stay here all day. I got nothing to do in the afternoon. Pastor? This is not your word. This is God's word. And I believe God's word. James 1 and 7. For that man ought to expect or not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. That is, the Lord will hold back the blessings. Young people, you're going to get married one day. You want God to bless your home? Then you keep the Lord your focus. You're dreaming. You start dreaming about Hawaii and $500,000 homes and Lamborghinis and all these things. You can expect to receive nothing unless you keep your eyes on the Lord. Nothing. Even if you're able to achieve a Lamborghini, whatever kind of car that might be, I know they're expensive. You'll never be able to pay for it. You'll be living for it. But it won't be a blessing of God. It'll be the result of your travail. We've got young people and old people right now living nothing more but for their homes because they overextended something they wanted to look in, look good in. But a blessing of the Lord brings no sorrow. Come on. The blessings of the Lord bring no sorrow. That is when you get something from God. It's going to stay there. And you're thankful because the next month, whatever finances you need, whatever you need here, God is going to provide. He's not blessing you when you buy something, you have to get three jobs to pay. Let that be a lesson in economics for you. Can I expect to receive anything from the Lord for he is unstable? That is, he can't make up his mind. He doesn't have any goals. He, 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 he can't set his mind whether he wants to serve the Lord or he wants to satisfy his flesh or his desires in life. 
Those of you in college understand what I'm saying. You will need to decide what your career focus will be. If not, you're going to end up with a thousand hours of college and no specific direction. <clears throat> Clear vision on the focus. When it comes to fully accomplished Christians... One of the biggest reasons you have a whole bunch of half-baked believers is because there are people that never really look to God on a permanent basis. They're wishy-washy people. They kind of look like Christ, but not really. They kind of resemble a child of God, but not really. Why? Because in church they do all the Christian singing, but out in the world they're doing as the world does. And the world knows. I've spoken to you about that. The world knows when you're half-baked. You're no threat to them. You're just like them. We've taken an evangelistical thrust here at Rock of Ages. And I've challenged you not to discourage you, but to make you effective. You see, unless we become who we say we are, people will never believe because they'll know you're a chameleon. That's it. I want people to believe I'm a Christian. When I speak to my lost friend, I want him to believe that Jesus has done something in my life. What makes, how can you prove that you found Christ? Because I'm changed. Because you knew me before. I was your drinking buddy before. I was out there in the clubs with you before. I used to be doing this and the other before. But now I'm changed. That's why I know that Christ is real. They need to know, unless you have a clear vision of who you want to become like, you certainly won't become like Christ. But you will become like who are you looking at. The Bible says that we cannot be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Deuteronomy 11 and 16. Be careful. Or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Then the Lord's anger will burn against you and he will shut the heavens so that it will not rain on the ground. The ground will not yield, no produce. And you will soon perish from the good land that the Lord is giving you. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and mind. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Be careful. Be careful. This is what the Lord says. Be careful. If you're not careful, the more you mingle with blurry eyes, the more you'll be enticed to bow down to the same gods the world does. And you will lose the good ground that God is giving you. God willingly is surrendering the blessings of heaven over you. These things he is giving to you, but you lose it all because you've learned to bow down to false gods. Proverbs 4 and 23, above all else, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth to keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead and fix your gaze directly before you. We're talking about clarity of vision. We're talking about the loss of focus. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that in these last days, God is wanting his church to refocus. Let us look to God again. This is where we find miracles. This is where we find true success. This is where we find financial help. This is how we find healing for our bodies. This is how we find blessing for our homes, wives, and husbands. This is where we find the desires of our hearts being accomplished as we serve and desire God. Hebrews 12 and 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that is, a lot of people are looking at you. The world is looking at us. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, when you go out there in the world, don't think that nobody's watching you. 
the world is watching you. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes. That is the goal, the mark, the prize. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. So we see that the first key to success in life and to becoming like Christ is to learn to have clarity of vision of Christ. To not lose our focus. Let me just say to you that the devil hates someone who is focused on the Lord. The devil hates young people who love Jesus. The devil hates pastors who love Jesus. The devil hates marriages and families that love Jesus. You're a threat to the principalities of darkness. And with that, we have to understand that he's going to throw everything in front of you to mislead you, to stifle you, to thwart you. Fix our eyes, fix our hearts, fix our minds, our ears, our emotions, our actions, all on the goal. Can I give you the next letter? No? No? You want to stand up and pray and go home? The next thing you want is to observe the examples of those who are unsuccessful. This is a very important principle. Listen, this is not, I'm not calling the church to be judgmental. Mm -mm. With this principle, some of you say, well, I'm going to be looking out for people who are failing. No. I'm not calling you to be judgmental. But we are to keep a clear-eyed focus on those who will show you what living without Christ will do. You have so many, sadly, so many examples around you. Philippians 3 I think I gave you the wrong principle. The first thing I will give you today is not unsuccessful, but successful is what I wanted to say. Observe the example of those who are succeeding in this effort. That is good Christians. Please rewrite that. I'll get to the other one later. Be clear-eyed of the example of those who are succeeding in this effort. Philippians 3 and 17 now. Let's move on quickly. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. It is a wise man, woman, boy, or girl who finds successful people and hangs out with them. Basically, what this is telling you is if you're going to focus on someone, instead of judging those per se outside, learn to focus your eyes on those who know how to live for Jesus. Learn to look upon the lives of who, those who have been in the Lord for 30 years, 20 years, 10 years successfully. And have never, you've never seen them turn back and say, well, I, I, I strayed for about two years and I came back. And uh, today I feel like a nut and not tomorrow. And but you want to find those friends. And there are young people who have friends and can find friends. Families, husbands, wives who can find ladies and men who have lived in the Lord successfully. Learn from them. What is it they do? What is their prayer like? Like, how is their church going like? What is, how do they go and move with their families? Learn from them. Learn from them. Look at the successful people who are clear-eyed on their focus and accomplishing. But isn't it an ugly thing, ladies and gentlemen? Now I'm going to begin to close shortly. Isn't it such a tragedy that we are more attentive to those who teach us wrong things than good things. Yeah? Isn't that the truth? 
You can have a really good church. And trust me, I've been in ministry only 40 years. Longer than many of you have been alive. And I have seen good Christian people. I'm going to get personal here. I have seen good people, good Christian young people, good Christian husbands and wives come into the church. Beautiful. Pastor, we had, the Spirit of the Lord was moving. Pastor, oh my God, God is awesome. And you look at them, you go like, yes, 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 yes. Feed, 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 feed. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Run after God with us. Run after God with us. But there's always brother and sister, no good for nothing in the church. There's always brother and sister get into everything but their business in the church. There's always that young person that lives a double standard life in the church. There's always that little pawn that Satan will use in the church. And isn't it incredible that they have such a magnifying polarity that he can take just walking in the circle the most awesome people that walk in, the most awesome young person that walks into the house of God and is worshiping next to you, all of a sudden he's hanging out, that, was, that person that's double-minded. By the next week, that brother and sister who have been here for a month now, enjoying themselves and loving God, all of a sudden they'll look at you. And they think they might not know, but we know that Mr. and Sister Good for Nothing got a hold of them. There's an admonishing word in the Lord that tells us that bad company will corrupt good character. And we have just read that we need to set our eyes on those who are living the example of Christ here in this earth. You want to grow in Christ? Keep your eyes on people who grow in Christ. You want to learn how to pray? Hang around with people that pray. You want to read the Word of God? Sit down in a Bible study with young people and uh, families that like to read the Word of God. You want to stay a churchcomer? Then hang around with those who wake up in the morning on Sunday and Wednesday evenings and say we're going to church together instead of those like, nah, not today. But somehow, and it's obvious that it's our flesh, we seem to Polarities seem to, there's a vacuum. It takes us to the non church goers, to the non givers, to the non helpers, and the non service people, those who are criticizing others in the church. And so we are commanded of the Lord. You want to be Christ like? God has left good Christians in the house of God. We have beautiful Christians in this house. Wonderful Christians. I would ask you to look in your heart. Are you who I'm talking about? Are you that wonderful Christian that we can look to and say, you know, I'll be an encouragement to you. I love Jesus. I will walk and encourage you anytime that we speak. Then get ready because people will learn to begin to adhere to you. I'm here to teach you and to tell you that God wants to bless you. But as we've learned, unless if you're double-minded, you can't expect. This is why we suffer so much. This is why we lack so much. This is why the church worldwide. Not, I'm not even talking all that much about Rock of Ages. I'm talking about the principle of living for Christ. I'm not personally attacking our church. I know you. I could sit here and talk to each one of you personally and say, well, I know you. I, I know that this is what you go. I, I'm not doing that. I'm telling you what struggles the church goes through. We need to be aware of these things. We need to be careful with these things. Unless we are clear-eyed, that blurry vision will take you to a place you don't want to go and keep you longer then you want to stay. Would you stand to your feet with me? All of this, ladies and gentlemen, this morning is going to enrich your worship. All of this that we're speaking about this morning, and I know it's a tough lesson. I didn't hear anybody shout me down. 
I didn't hear any applauses. It's not that I live on those. But I've kind of gauged that when you applaud, it's because it was just really nice and soft. I heard no applause, no whistles, no nothing. But I pray that this was able to be planted in your heart today and say, you know, I really got to think what I'm focusing on in life. You see, when you begin to focus on Christ, the, world, the, 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 the worries of this world begin to dissipate. Because there is hope when you focus on Christ. This is why the world today, in this political world that we're living, this political circus that we're living in today, people are losing their heads over what's going on. You know why? Because they're not looking to Jesus. The intent of everything that's going on around you has affected the church more than it's affected the world itself. I sometimes say this, that all this COVID thing and all this political thing that we're going through is more about the church than it is about the world outside. Because the church has gone through tremendous changes because of what's happened in the political world. I've lost friends because of politics. We've lost people in the house of God because of stinking politics. There's been a racial divide because of stinking politics. We've lost our focus. We're not looking to Christ. If we could look to Christ like before all of this stuff happened, we were all in peace. The world just two and a half years ago, was the church was full. Everything was working beautifully. Every brother, sister of all nationalities and colors in the house. We are a multicultural church here at Rock of Asia. Everybody is loving on each other. Whatever. But as soon as the devil began to stir the can, a lot of people began to look at that and all of a sudden indifference was born even in the house of God. I've spoken to pastors and how they've suffered because of the racial divide. Now everybody's a racist. There are no racists in this house and there better not be any racists in this house. This is not a house of many colors. This is a house of believers, born again Christians. We may represent a lot of nationalities, a lot of other countries, and that's fine. But here, there's only one color, and that's the red, crimson blood of Jesus Christ. And if you cannot see that, you've lost your focus. If you cannot see that, you've lost your focus. If as far as your eyes can see is the skin, you've lost your focus. Such a sad day for pastors. I cried and I still cry when all of this began to happen. When I began to see changes in the lives of people. I'm going like, what? Where is this born? Where is this coming from? We've lost our focus. Focus on your goal and make it Christ. And focus on those who are successful living for Christ today. And you will learn how to live for the Lord every day more and more. This is why the Lord really admonishes us to gather together as believers in the house of God. You know why? Because he's believing that in the house of God, you're going to find the perfect example of Christians you want to follow. Because if he didn't do that, he would say, well, go anywhere you want and just pick someone. Mm -mm. He said, I want you to go to the house of God. And you would say, why, Lord? Well, other than us coming to worship, hearing the word of God, because there you will find the example of me. I should be able to look at you and see Jesus and say, you know what, can I walk behind you and just see what you do? Can I just walk behind you, Brother Rini? Can I just hang around with you? I need to learn how to pray, man. Uh, I'm missing up here. Pastor Thomas, would, could I look at your life a little bit? And I, I, I know I'm staring at you. Catch me looking at you, but I'm not judging. I'm looking at how you handle yourself with people. Hey, can I please... Why? Never, ever give up gathering together in the house of God. You see, when people stop coming to church, that's when they learn other traits outside. The intent and the purpose of God to bring us together in the house of God is because in this house, He knows, He desires, He wants us to find people of like faith and like example. 
Do you notice that because of everything that's happened in our world today, the church is divided and people are out of the church? You know why? Because they were finding too much Christ in the house of God. They needed them to go and to focus on the world, to look at what people are preaching, division and all this ugliness, and look at them and say, I find sense in that. You're listening to an idiot. In the house of God, you will find an example. Follow people in the house of God that will teach you how to love God, how to come to church, how to pray for your meals, how to raise your children. What accomplishment, what an accomplishment when you see someone in the house of God whose children are going to the, to the church and, and going to ministry in church. They are successful. If your children aren't coming to church, hang around with them so they can teach you how to bring your children into the house of God. We're here to help each other. Don't be afraid to ask questions. How did you get your daughters to go to church, Pastor? How do your grandchildren raise their hands and worship the Lord, Pastor? Talk to their moms and dads. You need an example? Focus your eyes on people who succeed. Get away from those who will mislead you. Get away from those who will divide you. Get away from those who will take your focus from God and say, you can become this if you'll do that. You can be great here if you do that. You can do I may or not. But my primary focus according to Scripture is that I love God and that I love His Word. I want to be as clear-eyed as I can, ladies and gentlemen.